Hello again. Right, let's finish off the first week's lecture. We're going to look again, just recap a little bit, uh, to tie into the tail end of the uh, lecture we were conducting on Monday, um, and just briefly go over classification of networks. Now, networks can be classified based on the way the nodes exchange information. Uh, there are various types. The first type we could define is broadcast, uh, and this is where we yell out to a shared media, uh, and we share that, uh, that particular media between all the users. There's also switch networks. Now these can be further subdivided into either circuit switched or packet switch networks. Packet switch networks can be further divided into either datagram networks or virtual circuit networks, and we'll have a look at each of those in turn. The main reason that we have these different uh, types of network is they can offer different uh, types of service as well, or quality of service if you like, and each have their own characteristics. So there's reasons to use each type of network um, depending on the application your area area you're in, uh, and also dependent on the requirements of the network. Uh, a good example of this is a broadcast network is the more standard wireless uh, Wi-Fi network. The reason we use it is not because it's terribly efficient, uh, which it isn't really, but because it's very, very easy to install. So to install a wireless network, we plug a, um, an access point in, uh, we then configure it all up, and off we go. However, with a wired network, which is what we would use with our most of our packet switched uh, type networks, not that simple. We've got the infrastructure to put in, cabling is very, very expensive. Uh, not that the copper is that expensive, but the labour to put it in is very expensive. It requires modification of the building, etc. So there are reasons we use each different type of network. Just to go over briefly again, connection orientated means that we have to set up the connection, like the telephone system. It allows us to have reliable communication, and by that again, I'll state that I mean reliable means we know that something gets there, not necessarily that it gets there more often, um, but it is possible to have a uh, reliable connection with uh, connection oriented. Uh, and then we have connectionless. Here we have an immediacy to the communication. We don't have the time set up uh, taken to connect to the other end. So think of this along the mail system. We want our envelope to get to the receiver at some point. We're not particularly concerned with how it gets there, so we just drop it in a mailbox, and then the mail service takes care of how that envelope and its contents is delivered to the receiver. So no connection set up and connectionless. We have a time delay in connection orientated services, uh, uh, which we'll see in a couple of slides. Okay, we also have switch networks. Switch networks uh, consist of an interconnected collection of nodes. The data is transmitted by being routed through those nodes. <coughs> the switching method describes how the data is processed and routed. Now there's two basic methods as I mentioned. There is circuit switching and there is packet switching. Within packet switching we have two types of switching as well. Datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. We'll look at examples in a second. So with circuit switching, a circuit switch network is a dedicated communication network as I said, very much along the lines of a telephone system. The dedicated path is called a circuit switch connection or circuit. And in the good old days, that used to be a physical wire that was connected up by the telephonist. Now, each circuit, and if you watch the video that I've uploaded um, in the additional materials area, there's a good example of this using uh, the optical fiber uh, media. So have a look at that. Um, so with the circuit switching, our circuit occupies a fixed capacity of each link. It could be a time slot or it could be a frequency channel. It can be either way around for the entire time of the connection. So again, let's go back and have a think about the telephone call. Pick up our phone, we dial a number, it connect, creates a circuit, we connect to the person we want to speak to, and we have a dedicated channel for the entire time the conversation continues. This is very different in our packet switch network. Capacity unused by the circuit can't be used by any other circuit because it is reserved. If we are reserving a particular time slot or a particular part of the uh, physical cable uh, for our circuit switch network, if we're using it, we can use the full amount, but if we are not using it, nobody else can use it because that is a circuit belonging to us. Data is not delayed between the uh, switches in circuit switching because we set our path up first, which we'll see on a slide in a second. Um, Circuit switch communication involves those three phases, the establishment, dialing a number, the data transfer, our conversation, and then the overhead of actually pulling down that circuit. So when we hang up, we have to disconnect all of the devices in between. Um, 
all telephone networks and also optical networks are generally um, circuit switched. Well, they have to be because of the type of media they are. So in this case, we can see we've got uh, two stations, A and C, wishing to communicate with station D. Circuit one is set up. Now, to make this call, normally we have to make the connection between A and switch four, between switch four and five, and then between switch five and three, and then between switch three and D. So there is a considerable amount of time to set up that connection. But we can actually share the physical circuit with another user. So we've got C connecting to two, which connects to five, and then they share the path between nodes, or sorry, switch five and three. Uh, and this will be set up within the uh, link. And again, I would suggest strongly that you look at the uh, YouTube video that I've loaded, which explains how this works very well under um, uh, optical networks. Okay, as I said, there is timing considerations. It takes time to set this network up. So here we've got a pretty standard timing diagram. We've got our host, two nodes that the uh, information has to get through, and our receiving host. First thing we have is First thing we have is propagation delay. It takes time, a finite amount of time, for a signal to reach uh, from the sender to the receiver. The energy has to propagate down the, uh, down the cable, down the fiber optic, or through the air, and that is a significant amount of time, uh, and time that we have to count when we're looking at throughput analysis. So the first thing we have is the circuit establishment. So the host would send uh, a signal to node one saying, I need to set up a circuit. That particular node, set two there, would need to then process the uh, request, set up the connection, and send the request on to the next uh, switch at point three. Again, we have propagation delay. The switch at point three receives that request, has to set up the, uh, uh, the connection between the two switching nodes, and it then forwards the request onto the host. The host then accepts the connection. Um, we link the connection and sends back an acknowledgement through the circuit that is already established, so we no longer have those processing delays, back to the host that is transmitting. Our circuit is now established. So we can see that there's been significant propagation delay, there's been some processing delays, our circuit is established, and we can start sending data. But because we have a circuit in place, there is now no overhead at the switching nodes to the data. So we don't need to look at that data in any way, we just forward it straight on to the next node, so therefore there is no um, processing delay at that point, we only have our propagation delay from host to host. At the end of the data transfer, we need to tear that call down, so the hang up signal or uh, call termination signal is then forwarded back to the sending host and the termination of the call is undertaken. Okay, moving to packet switching. In packet switching, data is um, sent as format in bit sequences called packets, which is like packet switching, I suppose and they have the following structure. So we can see here we've got the header. This is the address information, uh, and it often contains quite a bit more than that, but at the moment we'll just treat it as if it's got the source and destination address. We have our data encapsulated within the uh, packet, and we have the trailer. Now the trailer is quite often just used for a uh, error checking. Each packet's passed through the network from node to node along some path. Now, we don't necessarily know what that path is, uh, but that's the routing. And at each node, the entire packet's received, stored briefly, it's stored briefly so that it can be checked. Right? Remember that we have the header data followed by the trailer, which is normally our error check. So we read the source and destination, work out where it's going to go. We read the data, and then we check to make sure that the packet has arrived error-free by using the uh, check within that trailer and that's why it is store and forward right it must read the entire thing store it check it for errors and then it can transfer it on note that with packet switching there is no physical capacity allocated for the packets so the channels aren't necessarily uh, big enough for the data that we're trying to send through right no reservation of resources packets are also called datagrams uh, the network nodes in each packet independently, now note that's important, independently um, process each packet and determine the path based on the header information, the address information within uh, that packet. Uh, so we've got an example here of host A sends two packets back to back to host B over a datagram packet network. The network doesn't know that these uh, packets belong together, so they can in fact take different routes. The implications of this is the sequence of packets can be received out of order. Now this is a big problem and 
requires us to allocate resources on the receiver end. So if we're receiving packets out of order, or may receive packets out of order, we need to keep every packet up to the point where the out of order packet arrives. So it requires resources at the receiver end to buffer up the packets uh, and then reorder them and then pass them to the higher layers. But it has the advantage that less state information needs to be stored. Right? We don't need to keep the path of the entire circuit. Okay, so an animation here just showing that packets are moving through, being switched independently and may be taking different paths through a network. The timing for such a network can be seen here. We have a host transmitting again through two nodes just to keep them. Okay, and the difference here is we don't have the call set up or teardown time. We transmit a packet, it travels to node 2 with the normal propagation delay as we had before. It is stored, remember it's stored and forward. Once it is processed, found to be error free, then it is forwarded to the next node, forward to the next node and finally reaches its host. At the same time, back here between nodes 1 and 2, the points 1 and 2, the host and the first node, we can see that we are just sending packets consecutively one after the other. So there is no time set up for a call, uh, so we have an immediacy of the uh, connection, but again we saw previously packets may take different paths. Now it brings up an interesting thing, and we shall look at this a bit later on, how packet size would affect the transmission overhead, node complexity and end-to-end -end transmission delay. But we'll leave that for a later date. Now a compromise between these two is the virtual circuit packet switching and this is used in a few um, uh, different technologies. Uh, frame Relay which is an older technology but a very interesting one if you want to have a look at it and we may touch on it later on. Um, and ATM, now that's not the machine where you get your money out if you have any. Uh, that is asynchronous transfer mode and uh, is a backbone technology which didn't really take off. Virtual circuits is a hybrid of circuit switching and packet switching. All data is transmitted as packets or cells in the case of ATM. Uh, packets from one stream are set along a pre-established path. Now this is a virtual circuit, it is not circuit switched. It is set up as a virtual circuit part of a uh, overall channel. This will guarantee our in-service delivery of packets along the same virtual circuit, but packets from different uh, virtual circuits can be interleaved so we can share the resource. If we think back to our circuit switch network, we couldn't share the channel. We allocated a physical connection between um, between end nodes, uh, and time or frequency was allocated to each of those circuits. However, here we can actually share um, the the resources. Communication within a virtual circuit takes place in three phases. As before, we have the virtual circuit establishment, very much the same as uh, circuit switched. We then transfer our data and then we have our disconnect. Alright, packets don't need to contain the full destination address. Why? Because we've set up a circuit and all it needs to retain is the circuit number. So we label each packet rather than an address, we label it with a circuit number which then allows it to take that particular path through the network. Now, as I said, because we have set up a path through the network through this virtual circuit, we have packets arriving in order and therefore relieving the burden from the um, uh, end machine, which can be important. If we don't know what sort of end machine we're talking to, it might not have resources to reorder packets. So it's very important that uh, we try and reduce the load on an unknown destination. However, we have to keep more state information at each node throughout the uh, path of the circuit. So here's an example, not animated unfortunately, uh, but we have packets travelling through virtual circuit 1 uh, from A to D. Uh, the circuit is set up, the packets are sent in order and they arrive in order. However, we can interleave other traffic along the same physical circuit using virtual circuit 2. The processing or timing for a virtual circuit packet switching is again very similar to that of circuit switching. We have the setup time, so the host talks to node 1, sets up the connection, gets its virtual circuit um, number allocated through each of the nodes until it reaches its destination. We have our normal propagation delay. Uh, and then we have the transmission delay again through the uh, packet orientated packet style um, store and forward. So it must read in packet 1 at node 2, 4.2, the first node in the network. It then checks that for the um, uh, for any errors using the trailer 
once it has the circuit number and it knows the packet is error free it will then retransmit it to the next node and so on and so forth at the very end of it we have the same as in circuit uh, switched virtual circuit termination Okay, so there's a comparison. I'll leave you to read through this, just comparing the circuit switch datagram and virtual circuit switching. Okay, so here are just some common networking technologies, telephone networks. This is not your this is not your mobile phone network. Um, this is the traditional plain old telephone system, POTS, uh, which uses circuit switching. The internet is mostly data packet switching, so that is just a packet switched uh, technique. However, the backbone is not necessarily reliant on packet switching. Uh, and that is because we don't have the control over the in-order packets. We don't have the ability to allocate bandwidth. Um, and that causes problems in our quality of service. ATM is a good example of this. Uh, it wasn't particularly well accepted, but it still exists in some of the backbones. So in summary, we looked at layered standardised protocols which allow for interconnectivity from different vectors, uh, also for rapid modification. Uh, an example we've got there is from wireless to wired Ethernet. The only thing we needed to change there was the lower physical and the media access uh, control layers. Um, and each layer provides a service to the layer above. Networks can be classified as broadcast, such as Wi-Fi and the old 10 base 2 uh, we might mention that a bit later on, or switched. And as switch ones, they can be the circuit switch, plain old telephone system as an example, or packet switched, Ethernet and IP, and also virtual circuits, ATM and frame relay come under the packet switch networks. Just a reminder, labs start this week in 207117. Make sure you've got your accounts created on netacad.com. Uh, lab machines don't use the Oasis login. Check on the whiteboard, all the login details are there. The machines boot up in either Windows or Mac OS. Use whichever one you prefer. Uh, and I would strongly suggest that you do at least one lab on real equipment. Don't rely solely on the remote uh, lab equipment or packet tracer. They're really good tools, but they're not the same as getting your hands on some real physical equipment. So do at least one or two labs on that for both intro to networking and um, uh, routing and switching essentials. Tutorials are starting week two, which is actually now. Uh, these are now weekly, so they will cover the material that's in the final exam, so make sure you turn up. If you don't turn up, go to one of the other um, tutorial sessions and do a catch-up. Okay, so again, it says there twice, I don't know why. Uh, tutorials are every week. So the lectures, as you'll probably notice, uh, there are none anymore. We're going to create short videos on Blackboard, two or three a week, I expect. Uh, the old lecture slides will be available, but... Um, they cover a lot more than we're actually going to be covering within the uh, uh, unit this semester. Um, have a read through if you like, but everything will be available via these short videos that I've been making and will continue to make. Um, consultation times. I'm available anytime uh, on Thursdays. My office number is there. Um, Consultation times. I'm available all day Thursday in 314-312. Email me if you have any queries. Uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, anything uh, that comes up. Naz is in 207-117 most of the time. Her office is across the corridor. She will be looking after uh, the labs and a large number of the tutorials. Now this will also be along. Uh, he'll be available during uh, tutorial times. He will be delivering roughly half of the tutorials. Now, as we have changed everything this semester, I'm really keen to get some feedback on the new approach. We can resume lectures if uh, that is the general consensus. Uh, I have no problem doing so. But please let us know how you think it's going, if the quality of videos is good enough, if they cover enough material, if they're covering too much material. We really do want to know and we do, believe it or not, listen. All right, so I'm going to now uh, start getting on with the week two uh, uh, recordings. These may be a little bit late because we've had a busy start to the semester, but I'm hoping that uh, I'll catch up over the next week or so. I'll be posting a lot of additional material uh, based on stuff I've found on YouTube. Um, these are worth watching. Uh, they usually give a more extended uh, explanation into each of the areas we're talking about. And it's also really good to get a second opinion or a second view on uh, how things work. So uh, have a look at those as well. Okay, remember, happy to take feedback. If you've got any questions, let us know. I'll see you in the next video.